the Midwest, from the Great Lakes to the Great Plains, and all the wonderful life in between. Home to some of the most fascinating and endangered ecosystems North America has to offer, but with our rapid urban and agricultural expansion, ecosystems are slipping away. It is up to us to take action and protect our land so that all life may continue as it was meant to be. It is our job to bring back what we drove out, drive out what doesn't belong, and make the plains wild again. I guess if I was going to identify kind of the major driver of landscape change in the Midwest over the last 150 years, <clears throat> I guess I'd probably have to phrase it somehow as market capitalism, um, encouraged and complied with partly because of the government. Most people neither know nor care except about the rudiments of uh, ecological issues, you know, but first and foremost, and it's understandable in most people's thinking is, you know, how can I provide a good life for myself, my family, my community, and so on. Especially when we're looking at the old Northwest states like Illinois, then you're going to be looking at, you know, dividing it up, plotting it out, and then selling it off. And so the Homestead Act, again, is kind of a device to expand uh, frontier settlement. Uh, was incredibly successful in terms of that expansion. On the other hand, because they got so excited about that expansion, they often would expand into areas into which it was very difficult to make a go at your, you know, 160 acres. And so there, um, so there, there, there are some difficulties related to the Homestead Act. And uh, once you go beyond what the land can sustain in terms of reproduction after heavy grazing, then the, we get a desertification process that can uh, uh, make the soil so loose that heavy winds can just get the soil moving and that's a terrible problem throughout Africa, throughout parts of uh, dry <coughs> lands in Asia uh, and even South America. In 1862, President Abraham Lincoln enacted the Homestead Act. The new legislation allowed Americans to obtain western land for next to nothing so long as they promised to farm it. After realizing the economic opportunity, in addition to several disputes with the Native Americans, the new frontiersmen started to kill off the American bison population. Without realizing the full impact of their actions, early America nearly drove the bison to extinction, a move we would surely regret. So keystone species are species that have a disproportionate effect on the structure and function of a community. And by, and by disproportionate, I mean, given their biomass and abundance in a community, they have an outsized effect. Keystone species is not generally superabundant species. Superabundant species are usually referred to more as foundational species. So grass in a prairie usually isn't a keystone, it's, it's a foundation species. Grass makes up the bulk of the prairie ecosystem. Altogether, prairie ecosystems contain 55 endangered species of grass, with 728 not far behind. But despite their abundance, these grasses aren't the only plants competing for growing space. So ecological succession is the, a regular pattern of development in communities where we see one species after another in a predictable sequence. Uh, the concept of succession is one of replacement <coughs> of plants uh, through time until a relatively stable endpoint is reached. The, the term relatively stable is important because no system remains stable forever. Ecological succession uh, then depends on 
the relationship between individual species and the environment. And so different species are going to be favored by different rates of disturbance, by different intensities of disturbance, uh, by different kinds of herbivores. And so the predictable pattern of community development at an ecosystem is going to really depend on how those factors interact. The drivers of ecological succession are often not things we think about. The large changes are driven by mainly a series of small, seemingly unnoticeable changes. Perhaps the factor we think about the least is what matters the most. So insects are kind of the fundamental um, component to most ecosystems. They are drivers when it comes to decomposition, pollination. Most animals use them as a food resource. So a lot of times what we see in urban environments is we tend to get to know like a few key insects. There's a few generalists that we see everywhere. But really the key to a healthy ecosystem is to have this diverse, um, this diverse uh, grouping of insects. And the more different kinds or diversity of insects that you can have, usually the better. And one good example of this is um, some of these studies that are coming out about pollinator ecology. And that uh, before we used to always just worry that bees were kind of the key element to a a good pollinator. But now they're finding out that a lot of the non-bees are there when, let's say, uh, it's too cold or it's too windy or something happens and the bees can't get to the flowers. Well, there's a whole host of other things that are, are getting to the flowers. And I think that's why um, looking at organisms that we don't always look at, like insects, can give us a better understanding of the overall um, dynamic quality that a lot of these systems have. Plants are co-evolved to depend on animals in multiple ways, right? Obviously, there's, there's plant pollinator relationships, uh, but plant herbivore relationships are also important as well, right? Herbivores don't just eat stuff, right? Herbivores change community structure. Um, bison feed exclusively on grass, which um, allows the prairie plants to foster. If grazing is not too excessive, <clears throat> it can be a positive thing because it opens up the understory. Tall grass prairies and even mixed grass prairies can, uh, can uh, experience decreases in productivity if the, uh, if the uh, vegetation close to the ground is very thick and it prevents light from getting to the bottom where where uh, bacterial and other kinds of activities uh, are enhanced by sunlight warming and so forth. And so uh, grazing herbivores are going to have food preferences. They're not going to have the same impact on every plant population. And so it's possible for herbivores to be keystone species where they maintain the diversity of a plant community by selective grazing. Actually, um, I, I think the importance of bison in prairie restoration is evident by the increase in uh, um, organizations that are doing prairie restoration are using bison. Um, the Nature Conservancy has, you know, realized the importance of bison and, and they've been doing it like since the 80s. Well, uh, introducing plants is one thing because if you're going to have a prairie you have to have uh, fire and at least some kind of grazers in there for optimal uh, development as a natural prairie. But when you start talking about really large animals, even deer can be a problem because deer uh, uh, reproduce so rapidly. But deer at least almost never harm people except perhaps by accident. And bison pretty much go where they want unless you have a very, very strong fence, even a woven fence designed to keep out uh, cattle. Uh, won't stop bison if they really want to go somewhere. They'll they'll even pound it down from the top or just break the the uh, attachment points, the fences, and so forth. One one of the things when we started uh, looking at um, reintroducing bison here, um, we went out to talk to our neighbors and to explain to them what we would what we would be doing and what steps that we were taking to ensure that. You know, the bison didn't create problems for them. Um, so we were very proactive about um, including our neighbors in our planning process. So 
they knew what was going on from day one. It, it's been, I would say, pretty, pretty problem-free. But problem-free doesn't mean it's been hands-off. Although the bison do as they please, their activity has not gone unnoticed. Bison are, are totally independent. They, uh, they don't require any management on our part. Uh, once a year we do a roundup. We inoculate the new calves of the year and then every bison has a sensor uh, in their neck that contains all the information about their genetics, where they came from, uh, information about like how much they weighed the previous year, a history of any kind of um, inoculations that they've been given. So when we do our roundup, um, we scan where the, um, the sensor is and all this information about that specific animal pops up on the computer screen. That uh, they <clears throat> uh, try to uh, rotate their herd between that you, so they will take every year maybe a quarter or a third of the animals, six, eight, ten animals, and they will exchange it with another place so that they can get fresh genetic material in the herds, which they normally would have had when you had all these millions of bison milling around all the way from Canada to Mexico and from the West Coast to uh, practically the East Coast. P populations are dynamic. Um, there are different you know, influences on systems every year. And the more diversity that you have, a lot of times the more elasticity you have in a system. And one of the goals um, that we have is we want to increase the diversity of the bison. And so we have a geneticist from, uh, uh, from the University of Texas who is mapping the DNA of the bison that we have. And he is telling us what bison need to be where to maximize you know, the reproductive genetic benefits. With all the trouble brought on by bison's lack of genetic diversity, land managers have looked to other grazing animals. First of all, cattle, they're a management intensive animal. Um, they tend not to move around, they'll tend to feed in one area and totally degrade the area. Um, they will only stay within, say, you know, like a thousand yards of their water source. So they don't move around. Um, they, uh, they require, um, in winter, for instance, they have to be, you know, generally, you can't leave them out in the field. You know, they, they, their feed has to be supplemented with hay. With all that being said, one has to wonder why we keep cows around at all. Perhaps we should raise bison as livestock instead. Could that possibly find a place in rewilding programs? I think we've seen some of it already. There's clearly a number of people dedicated to returning uh, some of these some of these areas to prairie, and and bison, which are obviously and clearly adapted to the prairie, are also you know can be pretty great sources of food. <laughs> so sometimes you can use those two things in conjunction, right? Where you you want to build and kind of restore a native prairie at the same time that you're interested in bison, right, in our own market um, of being able to kind of sell and eat and have some great burgers. And unscrupulous or just desperate, people come in and put in uh, grasslands to raise cattle so that Americans and Europeans and others can have cheap beef to go with their McDonald's burgers or any number of them. Uh, we like uh, cheap foods and meat sort of being the, the luxury food. Interesting, I don't know, it's kind of an aside that working with bison, I thought the one thing that I was, I'd heard a lot about people were managing them and consuming bison meat at some level and treating them almost like cattle. And then after working with them and actually seeing them being put through cattle shoots, I did have this appreciation for the fact that they are not livestock and they are not domesticated and they are quite wild. And I, I do have some level of worry when people start treating wild animals um, in the same manner that we treat domestic animals. Um, there, are, there are some questions about the humaneness of that sort of thing because they're not bred to be kept in captivity. So if we acknowledge that bison are meant to live wild and free in our own backyard, does that mean we accept it? Bison are large and potentially dangerous animals as well. Would I want them in my backyard? No. Bison would be great to have, but you dare not introduce them unless you have a very large area up to many hundreds of acres and probably more like 
uh, several thousand acres, and you have a very strong fence around the area where the bison are. Uh, my number one comment on that is I don't have a backyard, so they're welcome to do whatever they want with uh, other people's yards. Now, I just think that it's always going to have a, a really heavy human um, management impact, but honestly, I think that it's unrealistic to think that we, we don't need to reintroduce them at, at some level. You know, we're so conditioned and trained by Hollywood and the Disney movies, you know, oh, there's a sweet and lovable grizzly bear or a bison, I want to come up and pet it. What? Animal doesn't know anything about your interest and it'll just uh, potentially harm you or even uh, kill you, I guess. So I think in general, I think it would be um, a great way for people to get back in touch with the wilderness by having the wilderness at their back door. I don't know, a prairie without bison doesn't seem like much of a, a prairie. So bison would be great, but you must be uh, very uh, uh, well prepared and knowledgeable of what you're doing. Is there room in my mind for bison as a management strategy in uh, places where we're doing larger scale prairie restoration where there's space for bison herd? Yeah, I'd be interested in that. You know, this started like we started talking about this six years ago and, and we spent a lot of time looking at whether or not we should do this, um, the, the benefits and, and the cons against doing this. We went and visited other sites that had bison. We spent a lot of time learning how to work with bison, so this wasn't something that just happened. There was a lot of thought and a lot of research and, and you know, a lot of discussion went into doing this before we did it. And, and we think it was the right decision for us and we will continue to um, go along with this program.